This week on Bloodstream, COVID and hemophilia, clinical trials and adverse events, and surgery with von Willebrand disease are just some of the topics covered during last week's European Association for Hemophilia and Allied Disorders virtual conference. We'll provide some key takeaways and share our thoughts on things like the future of Factor A Concentrate. What a cliffhanger, Lynch. Hey, speaking of cliffhangers, later in the show, we'll be joined by Dr. Angela Wyant, a pediatric hematologist and oncologist out of the University of Michigan, who may be best known for her well-informed and highly opinionated Shematologist Twitter account. You know, there are some exciting things that are very basic science kind of level that are happening. And I, I hope that as, you know, people are more interested in the disease and more invested that, that more new treatments will come out. Hi all, I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your other host, Amy Board. And while Amy Board and I love talking to doctors. We really did love talking to the shematologist. I loved talking to the shematologist. This feels like a legitimate, like, girl, school girl crush kind of moment, like a pen 15 sort of thing. Do you want to It is, take a... though. I love her. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for being transparent about that. The point, though, is that Amy and I are not medical experts, so please be sure to consult with one of those before making any healthcare decisions. And reminder that you can watch. You can actually watch us. You can see our faces. You it's can true. see us on our Bloodstream Media YouTube channel. Subscribe to Bloodstream on Apple Pods or stream episodes directly from bloodstreammedia.com if you prefer to not see our faces which, you know, is your choice and feels legit. Thanks for listening. Rate, review, and tell a friend. And hey, welcome to Bloodstream. Big show to get to, as always. We have an incredible interview with Dr. Wyand. What a great guest. I mean, incredible, incredible insights that she had to share with us. I'm just, it was an amazing conversation, don't you think, Amy? Not to be, no, not to call you out, but you weren't even there. You weren't even allowed. It was all girls all the time. (laughs) <laughs> they wouldn't have known that, though. Unless, Well, I guess they wouldn't a little bit when my voice doesn't appear on the thing. But OK, well, thanks for not letting me even but have that moment. I- we I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But we do have Jessica Richmond, who is the co-host of Flow. She joins me for our interview with Dr. Wyant, the shematologist. Anyway, it was Lady Power. Well, I'll be a, a very happy listener of that segment. But uh, dear listeners, before we get to that and the rest of the content for today, I got to remind you that the Bloodstream podcast is made possible by our presenting sponsor. Takeda. Yes, that's right. Takeda. They have a website, bleedingdisorders.com. And you can go there to learn all about Takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. They have things like resources for people affected by von Willebrand disease, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, and inhibitors, as well as so much more. Takeda believes in a world free of bleeds and are dedicated more than ever in their efforts to offer a wide range of programs and support to help patients throughout their treatment journey, wherever on that journey they may be. You can learn more by simply visiting bleedingdisorders.com. One more time, that's bleedingdisorders.com. And for their founding and ongoing support of the Bloodstream Podcast, I would just like to say thanks to Kata. Now that I get to say all that, I get to ask one of my favorite questions each week here on Bloodstream, and that is this, Amy Board. How are you? Well, I'm fine. I think the bigger question is, how are you? It's the day. It's the due date day. (laughs) That's true. I am. I'm fine as well. Just wanted I, to look, ask if if you have a child or not. Like, <laughs> I don't. And not in the breathing okay. by itself world yet. But I do on my okay. wonderful blood feed calendar here. Uh, you can see D Day is what's written, which makes it seem a little more ominous in some ways than I, I think it's intended to be. But today's the day. Forty weeks today. Actually, Natalie, I just literally heard the garage open as she's on the way back from the forty week uh, midwife appointment. So yeah, we are we're in it right now. We're just waiting. Just waiting, a waiting Just game. Playing the waiting and we're game. recording on Wednesday, so listeners, you might have received an update at this point. This might be <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. Date. This is like the most like breaking might change by the time we publish piece of information we're going to share here. So, so we won't spend too much time on it because it might be irrelevant very soon. I just would like everyone to know that I wake up every morning and check my phone and immediately tell my household, no baby today, because we have so many people with due dates around this time. I mean, like there's like there's a there's a little herd of you people that there, it's been... there are. We got together and we said, look, it's a pandemic. We can't do much. Let's procreate. And we all agreed. So we're all we're all on the same timeline. Well, we're uh, all excited so... about it. <laughs> but I'm sure there'll be more information sooner 
than not. But speaking of more information transition, last week, as mentioned at the top, the European Association of Hemophilia and Allied Disorders, better known as EHAD, they had their virtual congress attended by 3,100 virtual participants. And by the way, you can still register and access content from that for six months. So if you are interested in the content that came out of the EHAD Congress, you can go to ehadcongress.com slash registration. There'll be a link in the program notes. And to any of my Cliff Notes fans out there, you know, those of us who in English Lit were like, that book is really big and I got a social studies test to study for. I'm going to grab the Cliff Notes and I'll do my best in the essay section to make up for what I'll get wrong in multiple choice. Well, if you're like me and that was your approach to schooling, you could just sign up for the conference and look at the wrap-up sessions that take place toward the end of EHAD's Congress. But there's a few things that I wanted to point out, Amy, maybe get your take on. Do you mind if I share these things that jumped out with you? I am just anxiously <laughs> awaiting the Cliff Notes version. I was an avid Cliff Notes user. I oh believe in them. I remember, did you ever like, are you hiding those books in, in school? Like, yeah. you know, and passing them to friends, but you can't let the teachers, and they were like yellow and black, right? It was like a bee, yes. like a bumblebee color. So it was very obvious when you had one of those out, which by the way, Cliff Notes, make your books more discreet. Like, don't you know who your audience is? Anyway, that's a whole, we don't have time for this. It's a, so, it's a thing. One of the major messages coming out of EHAD, we've said it here before, but it bears repeating. COVID does not affect people with hemophilia in some outsized way. And there is no reason that people with hemophilia should be particularly concerned about the vaccine. Again, COVID does not affect people with hemophilia in some outsized way. That was one big takeaway. So let's just get that right off the bat out of the way. Yep. Love it. I saw that Dr. Pipe, he is a pediatric hematologist. He's also the chair of NHF's Medical and Scientific Advisory Council. So his presentations and his opinion on matters are highly sought after. He presented Unicure's phase three gene therapy data update from their clinical trial, which listeners will recall was recently placed on hold when there was a carcinoma, liver cancer formation in one of the older patients. They are now trying to determine if gene therapy had a role to play in that. But what Dr. Pipe was pointing out was that the median factor nine level, so again, this is gene therapy for hemophilia B, we're at 37% with no fall in the first six months, and that patients with pre-existing antibodies to AAV responded as well. So this has been one of the sort of asterisks on gene therapy is exclusion, inclusion, criteria, antibodies to the vector or not. Well, according to the data presented by Dr. Pipe regarding Unicure, it seems as though those who had pre-existing antibodies to the AAV vector are also responding well in the trial. Also on the subject of gene therapy and amy this one i was particularly th so this is something that i dug into recently and that is data related to biomarin's program as listeners may also recall in august the fda and following the european agencies did not approve biomarin's application for their gene therapy roctavian as it's called or will be called commercially i suppose but there were a few things from the the phase three data that in spite of that procedural surprise, which is really all it was, was just a procedural surprise, are really, really, really compelling. And I wanted to share them here. So there were, it's either 132 or 134, I should have probably written that down, total patients involved in the trial. And that group kind of breaks into different subsets depending upon when they entered the trial. There are, there's two years data on some, there's, there's less on others, but there's two big pieces of data that I thought, hmm, that's really interesting to me. And then I learned one thing that changed my expectation of it as well. First piece of data, there was 112 people in this trial who were studied for a period leading up to their participating in the trial so that the trial folks could get a baseline on them. You know, how often are they infusing? These are all people who are taking factor eight prophylactically. How often are they infusing? How many bleeds are they having to get some kind of baseline? Well, the mean ABR, the average ABR, annualized bleed rate, was 4.8 per year for this group before the clinical trial. After one year, one year following their infusion with gene therapy, the average number of bleeds went down to 0.8. That's an 80% decrease from almost five to almost wow. one. And I, I, this is an important detail. That five came during a period where that 112 patients, they were being watched. I don't know about everybody else, but I know that when my doctors are like really reviewing my info or really digging into my data, I'm a little bit more adherent, like down to the dot and of I's and cross and T's than I am when I'm just kind of out there on my own. So that was an 80% reduction from like being watched. And I think right. that's an important practical thing to think about. Right. The other piece of data, 
And this is the one I got to say, I was like, wow, that's something. Again, all these folks before the trial, they are on prophylaxis. Well, on average, people were infusing 136 times per year, per person, 136 times, which makes sense if you're infusing prophylactically every other day, every three days, 136, 365 day year. Yeah, it makes sense. That's a big number, 136. That number dropped per person infusions per year from 136 to two. Two now, per on, person. Two per person. Now, on one hand, well, of course, they're on gene therapy. Wow. That's the idea. You're producing your own factor. You don't have to take factor. Yeah, that's the idea. This is the data. This data is saying that it, you last year maybe had to stick a needle into your arm to put factor in there 136 times. And then subsequent to this infusion, twice per year. I mean, that, I get chills saying it because just from like a yeah. real world experience point of view to me, that's amongst the most important pieces of information that I have read about that program. This is a dumb question. I feel like I should know this question. But all of this is new, right? Like this is this is how clinical trials function. So when Biomarin got the news that more data was necessary in order to approve this gene therapy, then this, this data coming yeah. out, this bleed data is new, right? So it's like new... When Biomarin submitted to the FDA, I believe the only extended data they had to provide were from 17 individuals who had been in the trials for at least two years. And there was a big drop off in factor eight production between year one and year two. In year one, factor levels on average were at about 42, 43%. By the end of year two in that group, they were down to about 24%. So that's a big drop off. However, right. there was still only about one bleed per year that needed to be treated in that second year. So even with only an average expression of 24%, still that group went from previous to the trial, five bleeds a year, 4.8, to at that stage, mm -hmm. one bleed per year, which also kind of brings up this, not million, billion dollar question of where's that line? How much factor production equals quote unquote functional cure? And then durability, that's the big question is durability. Because yes, so far this looks great, but if we watch the, the factor production numbers dropping as we get from year one to two, two to three, there is a threshold whereby we will start seeing more bleeds and more factor needing to be used. We just don't know where that line is yet. And that's kind of right. exciting and also concerning. Right. And I guess they obviously they work hand in hand, but it'll be really interesting to see like what number is the number that's most important, like I bleed know. rate. You know what I mean? Probably also depends who you ask, because if you ask the, in, the payers yeah. who are going to be paying for this stuff, they might be most interested in 136 infusions to two. If you ask patients, right. they may be more interested in the bleed rate number and the not bleeding, right. you know, so and all stakeholders have some say in how this right. rolls out and, and is accepted. So a lot of data kind of like to, to comb through and to to your point, like to try to determine what of this is most indicative, what of this is most right. determinative. So certainly something that I was excited to read. There's one quick, fast thing, Amy, before I know we're going to move into our interview that I was so mm -hmm. happy to be a wonderful part of. And I mean, I kind of led the whole thing and really thank God I was there. But oh we're going to talk God, to Dr. Liar, liar, Wyatt. Pants on fire. Momentarily. But last thing I did want to mention, a little bit of a sobering thought. You know, Professor Macris put out a tweet kind of like a something to keep an eye on, and that is the incidence of thrombotic events. So when we hear about adverse events, adverse events can, it, it really ranges. It's basically something quote unquote negative that's not intended as a result of taking the medication. So one example of an adverse event would be developing an inhibitor. So if you take factor product and develop an inhibitor, that's technically an, ad an adverse event. There was a European body that collected info between October of 2008 and February of 2021. So about 13 years of info, just shy of 13 years. And they were looking at different adverse events in hemophilia. First occurrence of inhibitors, and we know that inhibitors can form 20 to 30% of the time in all cases of severe hemophilia. There was 548 first occurrences of inhibitors in that 13 year period. There were 286 thrombotic events. So that's about, for every two inhibitor cases, there was one thrombotic event. 
And that has not been uh, that that's a new thing that we're seeing. And that was the point that the professor was making that from the 70s into the 90s, we had to worry about transfusion transmitted infections, HCV, HIV, et cetera. 1990, with the advent of recombinant medication, now we have a new thing called inhibitors and the, the allergic response that this medication has that we call inhibitors. We got to deal with that big adverse event. And now it seems as though, as we're looking at different kinds of uh, mechanisms of action and not just straight factor replacement therapy, the clotting cascade is a delicate thing. And as we're tweaking it, it seems as though thrombosis is starting to flag as something we need to be cautious of to a degree that was not true 10, 15, 30, 40 years ago. Something to certainly keep an eye on, to talk to your doctor about if you're considering switching medications or changing anything significantly in your regimen. Do keep these things in mind. Ask your doctor about thrombosis when you talk to an actual healthcare provider, which Amy and I- I'm not. just about to say, I was, that was gonna be my comment. Like, can't stress <laughs> enough how Patrick and I are not medical professionals, cannot stress. Anyway, I also wanted to mention before we get into Dr. Wyant, Macris tweeted something else that is widely known, but of course we saw it first with his Twitter account, you know, good old Professor Macris. But he also let us know that unfortunately, one of the treatments for von Willebrand's disease, a common treatment for von Willebrand disease, stymate, the nasal spray, is not going to be available until the second half of 2023. And Dr. Wyan actually touches on it in our interview, but just kind of incredible. And mm -hmm. as we are straining for treatments with von Willebrand's disease, it just seems like a shame. Well, you know what? Let's get into it. Here we have Amy with Jessica Richmond, the co-host of Flow, speaking with Dr. Angela Wyan, or the Shematologist. Jessica and I are here with Dr. Angela Wyand, who's from the University of Michigan, a hematologist. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Angela, we're so excited that you're here with us. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. You are well known on Twitter as the Shematologist, which is the most brilliant name, maybe on Twitter, a little Twitter famous, curious to know how the name came about. Ha, ah, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I don't exactly even really know. You know, I have always been really interested in the care of young women and girls with bleeding and clotting issues and actually um, joined Twitter years ago, but never did anything. And then kind of in late 2019, started to get more involved with Twitter, especially professionally. Um, and at some point, I can't remember even when, um, I thought I should have something more interesting with my name. And so I um, had heard terms like shemophilia thrown around and I was like, oh, well, I'm clearly, you know, not a hematologist, I'm a shematologist. Uh, so I went with that and didn't even really necessarily know if I would keep it, but then had a lot of positive feedback. So here we are. You have always been a vocal advocate about women and uh, gender equality in hematology. Um, what gave birth to those passions and what has your trajectory been like? Yeah, so, you know, I think it ultimately goes back to just the patients. Um, I feel like I see a lot of young women uh, and girls who, by the time they get to us, have suffered and been miserable for months or years with, you know, horrific periods and oftentimes had their concerns dismissed or, um, you know, had no workup done for months and months, end up having to be admitted to the hospital and get blood transfusions um, and just generally be miserable. Um, and I think that um, seeing that and realizing um, that this really was a big problem um, is what kind of initially got me interested. I, when I first started as faculty back in 2016, um, I knew I wanted to start a clinic specifically for girls like this. And there's actually a foundation for women and girls with blood disorders, um, which is very helpful. And so I had emailed them and went to their first meeting and um, they were great in terms of helping us start that clinic up. Um, but I think just, you know, you see so many girls that um, often don't even realize themselves that what's happening to them is so abnormal and that they shouldn't have to miss a week of school every month and they shouldn't have to feel stigmatized for bleeding onto their clothes and um, they shouldn't have to go through all of that trauma, especially because being a teenage girl is so hard aside <laughs> from all of that. And then you add <laughs> bad periods and it's just yeah. cruel. So, um, so I think that's, that's what kind of led me on this path. Here, here. I, I'm curious, from your point of view, how can we all, and I mean all of us, be better or do better um, in our efforts towards equity in healthcare? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And I think um, when I think about that, I think the first thing is just really even being aware that there is a problem. And that goes for even, you know, I call myself a schematologist and feel like this is something I'm really, you know, passionate about. But I think we oftentimes, because things are so ingrained in how society and healthcare work, we don't even necessarily acknowledge that there are underlying issues that contribute to that. So, um, for example, you know, I think I had thought about these girls and how they weren't getting adequate care and we needed to change that. But I never really had even considered, you know, all of the sexism behind that and kind of like historically what might have contributed to that. And so in the fall, I actually had like, I do these little tutorials where I teach about different hematology topics. Um, and I'd been getting some requests for different topics. And so I was like, let's do a fundraiser. And um, Paula James ended up winning and donated a bunch of money and um, picked the topic of sexism in management of bleeding disorders. And that was actually super educational for me and enlightening. And just going back and seeing like how little funding goes into diseases that affect women like von Willebrand's disease versus hemophilia, which has historically been thought of as a male disease. Um, and just all of the things that kind of, you know, the fact that periods just aren't talked about. Um, there's this huge stigma around them and um, people don't know what is normal. And so I can't tell you how many girls sit in front of me and say, my periods are fine. And then that means that they bleed for three weeks in a row and can't go to school because they're bleeding onto their clothes and the teacher won't let them go to the bathroom. And, and none of that is fine, right? but they've normalized that in their heads. And I think especially with diseases like von Willebrand's disease, where, you know, if their mom has it as well, she's not necessarily having, you know, alarm bells go off that say that's abnormal because she suffered through or is currently suffering through the same thing. Speaking of von Willebrand's disease, perfect transition. Mm-hmm. Um, you were a part of this coalition that ideated these guidelines for von Willebrand's disease. We, we've discussed them a little on the podcast, but um, from your point of view, tell us a little bit about why these guidelines were needed. What was the gap that they were feeling? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I think, um, you know, von Willebrand's disease is the most common inherited um, blood disorder, but unfortunately for so long, I think. Um, it hasn't necessarily had the most clear guidelines in terms of how to diagnose it or how to manage it. Um, And so historically there were kind of all of these different groups that came out and said like, this is what we recommend, but a lot of them actually were directly at odds with one another. So um, for example, like, like how do you diagnose someone with von Willebrand's disease? Some people said your level needed to be less than 50 and some people said less than 30 and then other people said less than 40. And so depending on, you know, if you're a patient, depending on what physician you see and what guidelines they're looking at, the same patient could be diagnosed with von Willebrand's by one physician and then have another physician say, no, no, you know, your level is in this area where I wouldn't even consider you to have von Willebrand's disease. So I think it was this amazing undertaking. It was, you know, a huge project to get these four different groups together. And I think the logistics of that is incredibly difficult, but um, was so needed in order to try to have more of a consensus for these issues. Because I think if we can't even come to a consensus, you know, how difficult must that be for patients who, you know, if they move and go to a new physician, they may have had a diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease for decades and then go to someone new who says, oh, I don't even think you have von Willebrand's disease. Um, I think that can be a real problem. Wow. Wow. So then I, I want to know, what was the coalition like or how did you come to that co- consensus with differing information from different contributing members at first? Yeah. So I think they did a really fantastic job. You know, I think they really thought this up out um, and it took years um, to do. So they definitely had, I think, really good representation on the panels. They had hematologists, but also like our panel had a gynecologist, like obst- obstetrician gynecologist. Um, there were patient representatives prior to mm. Um, the questions being decided on, they put out a survey and had really great engagement from the community in terms of physicians and patients saying like, what are the issues that are important to you? Sitting on the panel itself, I think there was so much discussion of like, okay, you know, what kind of questions we want to answer? And then once we kind of came to an idea, it was like, are we really representing everyone here, right? Like, are there patients that are going to feel left out if we answer these questions? Because there's, you know, so many more questions we could have answered, but you're limited by time and resources and everything. So I think they did a fantastic job, you know, trying to take into account everyone's opinions. Um, And really, I think when it came down to those questions of, you know, like where I wasn't on the diagnosis panel, I was on the management panel, but you know, where are we drawing the line or what is our recommendation going to be? It really was a very good discussion and like trying to get people all 
um, to kind of be on the same page. And I think sometimes with patients felt like, um, you know, it has to be a little bit intimidating to sit on a panel. I mean, I was the most junior physician on my panel and I was like, I don't belong here. These people know way more than I do. Um, I can't imagine like as a patient sitting there and, and, you know, having to speak up and say, you know, I disagree with you, the person who's published, you know, the most on bundle of brands disease in the last decade. Um, but I think people were so inclusive and, um, you know, when patients weren't always contributing then you know, would be sure to kind of try to bring them in um, and make sure we were taking in um, their perspective. And I think a lot of the things that were considered are things that I never realized um, like guidelines took into account. Like for example, when we were saying like, okay, we're gonna say that combined hormonal contraceptives um, are you know recommended for heavy menstrual bleeding. Then there was a question while we were coming to that to that conclusion of like, what will this do for equity? You know, how how will this like affect equity or how will this affect access? And how will, um, you know, all these issues that I kind of thought when people made these guidelines, it was like, here's the science and this is what we say. Um, but there was a lot of discussion of like these bigger societal, you know, we want to be inclusive of patients and we want to make sure that people have access to appropriate treatments and um, that we're not disadvantaging people by saying, you know, one thing versus another. It's fascinating. Is this normal, like, to to create guidelines um, for the management of a disorder or a disease? Is this normal in the physician community, in the patient community as well, to have like a coalition like this? Um, you know, I haven't seen it be uh, as um, much like having four huge organizations all come together to do it. Um, I know Ash has done a number of these kind of guidelines over the past. Um, years on on various different diseases, um, but I haven't seen it be as much of a kind of collaboration between big organizations. Interesting. And what, tell us a little bit, share with our listeners a little bit the importance of creating a standard of care in particular for um, a disorder like von Willebrand's disease. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, a lot of it is just, um, as I mentioned before, um, that you know, you don't want patients to go to one physician and be told one thing and then have another, you know, physician say something completely different. And I think that happens a lot in medicine, but the more you can try to prevent that from happening, the better. Um, I think that there's so much information out there. And I think a lot of patients um, with hemophilia and with femoral Burns disease and with all kinds of bleeding disorders are being treated in the community, not at large academic medical centers or hemophilia treatment centers. And that, you know, those physicians are taking care of patients with, you know, a like huge number of different problems. And so it's not really reasonable to expect those physicians to know everything and to have reviewed all of the literature. And so I think having this very systematic standardized approach of reviewing all the literature and having experts in the room and, um, you know, putting all of this work into these guidelines that then can inform that is just going to be so important for patient care where you have a hematologist in the community who didn't have to read, you know, 800 papers, but can refer to the guidelines and say, like, this is the right thing. And I think it also goes back to, um, you know, trying to make sure that patients have access to things. So, um, for example, I know one big part of the discussion around where the cutoff would be for diagnosis was really wanting to be inclusive of patients. And if you have a patient who has levels between 30 and 50, which previously some people would have said is not von Willebrand's disease, and they're bleeding, that if you say in your guidelines that's not von Willebrand's disease, those patients are going to have difficulty getting, you know, insurance to pay for their care. Um, for you know, we have in pediatrics, like in Michigan, we have Children's Special Health, which you qualify based on like having a, you know, qualifying diagnosis and um, and things like this. Where if you you know by being more inclusive, um, you're going to have more patients be able to access the appropriate care. And I think similarly for the management. You know, historically, people haven't thought about prophylaxis as being um, integral to von Willebrand's disease the way it is with hemophilia. Um, But I think, you know, specifically commenting on that um, was so important because there are patients that need prophylaxis and that benefit from prophylaxis, but um, it is an expensive thing and one that insurance companies oftentimes don't want to pay for. And so I think again, having that be one of the questions was really important in terms of trying to help these patients access appropriate care. And if a physician can prescribe that and then, you know, when they get the inevitable denial, 
then they can, you know, pull up, here are international guidelines that outline that these patients can benefit from prophylaxis. That's a lot easier um, to kind of push that issue um, if you have that backing than if um, you don't. Wow. I mean, then prophylaxis, and you mentioned the diagnosis cutoff details, sound like some of the highlights. I'm curious from your perspective, what other highlights from these guidelines yeah, so I think that's um, you know one of the ones that I think people were most um, interested in was um, the cutoff for the diagnosis, just because that's been kind of an ongoing controversy. Of um, previously, people would say some people would say that like 30 to 50 was low VWF, and would say that's more of a risk factor for bleeding versus a disease. Um, so I think people are were very interested in that, and I think that's a really important one. I think the prophylaxis. Um, I think within the management, um, we had a question on heavy menstrual bleeding, which for me was, um, I think, really important. And then we had a, um, some questions on um, delivery as well um, around obstetrics. And I feel like um, that's important because, again, it's one of those areas where there's not a lot of data and uh, people definitely need guidance. What were the menstrual bleeding guidelines? What did it specifically say yeah, so- around menorrhagia? That was actually one thing that I thought was really interesting about being on the panel is um, being in medicine, you know, there's constantly studies coming out and so much data and you think like, oh, we have all of this data. And then um, when you have a team specifically where like their whole job is to like evaluate how good is this data and is this really answering the questions we want? And then they present it to you, there's so little data actually that is good and that can kind of inform these. So, um, so when you look at actually the guidelines they go through and have like an evidence to decision where they talk about like, for example, the question was, you know, how should we treat women with vulnerable liberance disease and heavy menstrual bleeding? And this would be like upfront first line therapy. Um, and they talk about like, these are the studies that we looked at to, to decide this. And there were really two studies and then five case series that, that, ultimately informed the recommendation, which when you think about like the number of studies that are out there is very few and only one mm-hmm. of those was actually a randomized trial. So um, we ended up settling on um, that for women who are um, not interested in currently conceiving that either a combined hormonal contraceptive or an antifibrinolytic like Lysteta would be first line over something like DDABP. And then in patients who um, are hoping to conceive Obviously, hormonal contraception is not going to work for them, so it would be life data um, over something like TV ABP. Interesting. What was the physicians' community like? What was the physicians' community reaction to the guidelines? That was a mouthful. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think um, I think good. I think um, one really nice thing that Ash has done both mm-hmm. with these guidelines and some of the other guidelines that they've come out with is. Um, really involving people before they're published, which I think is really important. So not only with the like pre-survey of like what issues should we be addressing, but then um, once we kind of had the draft of the guidelines, that was put out for both ours as well as the diagnosis guidelines. And, you know, it was open for comment from anyone. Um, And I think they really took those comments and feedback very seriously and, um, you know, modified things if needed in terms of really trying to incorporate as much feedback and perspective as possible. I think that people are excited about, I mean, I, I've heard of a lot of excitement. I don't know if people would tell me if, if they thought they were bad, but, <laughs> um, you know, mainly I've heard, heard very positive things. And how do you suggest a patient handle these guidelines for their own benefit or, or what should they be most aware of? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a tough question. I think it, it depends somewhat on the patient and, you know, I think, Um, As a physician, there's such a broad spectrum of patients in terms of people who come in and know more about their disease than the physician does, and then people who really much more on the camp of like, just tell me what to do to make me feel better. And, you know, I'm not interested in in, like the details surrounding that. But I think for patients who, um, especially for patients who end up needing to advocate for themselves, I think even just knowledge that the guidelines are out there is important. the guidelines themselves, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're very dense and very long. Um, and so um, I think one really nice thing that has been going on and continues to be in process is that Ash has been working on a lot of like kind of educational tools and um, things for to kind of um, communicate the guidelines and the recommendations in a, in a more accessible way um, rather than, okay, here's a document that's um, multiple inches thick and, you know, very um, heavy with 
words that may not might not make sense to people. So I think that will be really nice to have more of that um, basic communication and have it be more accessible to people. But I think patients, even knowing they're out there and um, you know being able to go to their physician and say, you know, I heard that some people need prophylaxis. Can you discuss with me like what that might mean for someone like me? Because you know, in the guidelines, um, we talk about it for patients with severe recurrent bleeding. But what does that mean, right? It's, I think there's a lot of nuance to things and um, definitely a conversation with, um, you know, their personal physician is um, going to be helpful. But I think knowing they're out there and then if they are in a situation, unfortunately, which some patients are where they don't feel like maybe their concerns are being heard or don't feel like um, they're getting the care that, that they think they need being able to say, you know, I know these are out there and can we discuss them or can you explain them to me or explain to me why you know this isn't applicable to me um, and hopefully can have some good conversations from there. We, um, we've spoken before about the difficulty of diagnosis in von Willebrand's disease. Um, how will these guidelines, if these guidelines will support more accurate testing for VWD in the future? Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, it's definitely, I think, a complicated issue and I think adds to um, the frustration with patients just in terms of, again, like even um, now that we have good cutoffs, there's still so much um, difficulty with accurate lab testing. So actually through the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, um, Dr. Julie Jaffray had run a study that a number of our centers were involved with where we looked at how labs are processed, like where they're collected and whether they're processed on site and um, kind of how different hospitals were running the labs and there's incredible variation and what was shown was that um, you know if you're processing them someplace different than they're drawn and that all these different things can add to misdiagnosis so MASAC which is the medical and scientific advisor committee for the National Hemophilia Foundation actually came out with a statement in September of 2020 recommending specific things about processing and um, how testing should be done, which I think will be really important just in terms of, um, again, like access where sometimes we would have referrals and they would have had testing done elsewhere where the testing wasn't optimal and we want to do it, but the insurance says like, no, no, we're not going to pay for this. But having that, you know, big group say like, you know, this needs to be done in a certain way can help, you know, make that not not an issue. So I think that's one thing. And I think with the testing further, I think not only is it difficult, but um, there are so many assays and the diagnosis guideline panel actually talks about a number of different guidelines and they ended up recommending um, an assay called GP1BM, which is basically just a platelet binding assay, but is not what has historically been used um, and definitely does seem to be better, but is unfortunately not available everywhere. So again, I'm Mm -hmm. hopeful that, you know, with this, the guidelines coming out that um, that may prompt centers to say, okay, well, we need to, you know, move more into doing different testing than we've been doing um, that might be more accurate and hopefully having the weight of the guidelines behind them that will be more likely in terms of, you know, getting funding to do that or um, the political wherewithal to do that. <laughs> I can't believe I haven't asked you this. I should ask everyone this right out of the gate because it's so tricky and everyone kind of has a different nuanced answer. How do you describe what von Willebrand's disease is? <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting in a room, you know, with a preteen. Like, how do you describe what it is? It's so tricky. It is so tricky. Um, so usually I try to just describe it as you have a number of different um, factors in your blood that help when you are cut. So normally when we get cut, our blood vessels, um, you know, have a hole in them. And so you bleed and that in order to patch up that hole, we have all these different factors and that von Willebrand's factor is one of them. And it's very important and works with platelets as well as some other blood factors to just help plug that hole. And so if you don't have enough of that, or if the factor that you do have doesn't work appropriately, then you're just going to be more at risk for having bleeding. And is this, this feels like an elementary borderline ridiculous question, but because von Willebrand's factor, the factor has multiple jobs, like it has some platelet jobs, but then it's also connected to factor eight in a way. Is that why it's so tricky to like diagnose Um, and like figure it out? I I think um, somewhat, yes. So exactly. And I think um, that's part of what um, they kind of get towards in some of the guidelines in terms of there's all these different assays because it does bind platelets. So like mm. historically, the activity assay is just how well does it bind platelets. But we also know it 
binds collagen. And historically, that's not something that's been tested. And mm -hmm. then there's the factor eight binding. And that's, you know, a whole different subset of von Willebrand's patients that have an issue with that. Um, so there are just kind of all these intricacies to it. And I, I think you're exactly right. I think the fact that it has multiple functions and then the fact that it has much multiple functions is also why clinically it can be very different, right? So if you have a patient who has type three or type two N, um, they may have joint bleeding very similar to patients with hemophilia um, versus patients, you know, type one patients that are unlikely to have joint bleeding, but are more likely to have mucosal bleeding, like right. heavy periods or nosebleeds. Nosebleeds, yeah. Do you think these guidelines will help generate more interest in creating treatments for VWD in the future? I'm just, I, I'm always blown away when I talk to physicians that we don't have more treatments in the pipeline. Yes, Close yes. my mind. Yes, it's it's insane. And I think um, I actually, after seeing uh, Peter Linting's talk at ISTH where he talks about, um, you know, just kind of, I don't know if you guys saw this, but he, he basically talks about how there's been this incredible progress, like very rapid progress made in hemophilia. And there's all of these different new, you know, drugs, like non-factor drugs and gene therapy and, you know, all these amazing advances that have happened, which is awesome. Um, but if you look at it compared to von Willebrand's disease, it's ridiculous, right? How many drugs are in development, how many clinical trials are um, being enrolled, especially when you think about the fact that hemophilia is a rare disease and von Willebrand's disease is the most common bleeding disorder. Like the discrepancies there are um, definitely frustrating. And I, Dr. James and I wrote, you know, an editorial about sexism and bleeding disorder and actually talk about that just about how, like in every way, right? Like the research that's being done is in hemophilia and the, you know, money that's being invested is in hemophilia. and. Um, so I, I do hope that it will. I think that, you know, there are some exciting things that are very basic science kind of level that are happening. And I, I hope that as, you know, people are more interested in the disease and more invested that, that more new treatments will come out, but because we definitely are lacking currently. Well, I appreciate your work, and I appreciate um, you mentioned Dr. Paula James, who are, who is going to be a guest in March, actually, on Flow, and we can't wait to have you on Flow. So you're going to get another uh, Twitter DM from us to be on. <laughs> well, now we have your email, so we can email you proper. She's my shero, and she's amazing. And she was like, she's write a tutorial on sexism and bleeding. And I was like, sexism and bleeding disorders. And then I wrote it. I was like, oh, my God, sexism and bleeding disorders. Like, this is bad. So yeah, she's great. She's fantastic. And it's been like a trailblazer. There's so many out there. I'm going to get on Twitter now. I'm going to get on Twitter. I'm going to do it. I haven't been to, I'm going to get on Twitter just for your tutorials. I got to check it out. Don't, I've learned that you don't post about vaccines, vitamins, or Tom Brady. <laughs> out all of the badness. <laughs> That's fair. Thank you so much. We can't wait to have you back. This is uh, really enlightening and so important for our Von Willebrands community. So we can't wait to have you back and follow up. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you to Dr. Wyand for joining Jessica and Amy here on Bloodstream. We appreciate your expertise. And if you would like to follow along with everything that Dr. Wyand has to say and report, you can do so on Twitter. It's the most entertaining way where she goes by the Shematologist. You can also follow links in the program notes. And join us next week. We are going to do a deeper dive into the Pain Pod Season 2, which is out now. Episode 1 is out now. It came out this week. If you haven't had a chance to listen, make sure that you do. It's available on bloodstreammedia.com and wherever you get your podcasts. Corey from Tremo is going to be with us. You actually hear from her on the first episode of the Pain Pod, and she's going to share a little bit about why it was so important for her and Tremo to be supportive of that story. So anyway, check it out next week. Also, the primary patient story that drives the first episode is from a guy named Patrick. Not me, but, you know, guys named Patrick who have to podcasts that generally works out really, really well. Thank you, Amy, for giving us that sneak peek. Thank you, Greg and the Bloodstream team, for everything you do to make this podcast happen. Thanks to Kata for being the presenting and ongoing sponsor of the Bloodstream podcast. Bleedingdisorders.com is their website. And that is all for this episode. <laughs>
Do you have a bleeding disorders or health topic that you would like to hear us discuss? Is there an expert or a guest that you're just dying to hear from? Do you want to inquire about casting opportunities for Bloodstream and Believe's narrative and docu-styled podcast series, web series, video series? We've got a lot of series, especially right now. Email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You can also connect with Bloodstream Media on social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can watch our episodes on YouTube. You can follow Amy Board or myself on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Shout out to all the committed LinkedIn users out there. Just give in already, Bordeaux. Check out the program notes for this episode in your podcast player or on bloodstreammedia.com, where you will find links and information related to the stories and segments featured on this episode. I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your other host, Amy Board. And until next time, take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. 